Dampness in Buildings and Diagnosis, Module 10 Water Vapour Water Vapour and Vapour Pressure All air contains water vapour and this exerts a pressure, vapour pressure, and that is directly related to the amount of water vapour present. The more water vapour in the air, the greater the vapour pressure. In other words, it reflects the level of water retained in the air. However, it's important to appreciate that vapour pressure is not proportional to relative humidity. Relative humidity is dependent on temperature. Vapour pressure, measured as kilopascals, is not. Relative humidity and vapour pressure. There we go. On the left, relative humidity expresses the actual water vapour in the air as a proportion of the saturation level, and this can clearly be seen in the two diagrams to the left. 50% RH at 20 and 50% RH at 10. However, if we deal with vapour pressure, that reflects the actual amount of water in the air. In other words, we look at the diagram again. We're just using arbitrary units. At 20 degrees, we have two units vapour pressure, and at 10 degrees, one unit vapour pressure. Indeed, if we increase the size of our bucket in the top diagram to 10 times the size and put that amount of water into this much larger bucket, there will still only be two units of water. It's also interesting to see external atmospheric conditions, the vapour pressures. And note here the colder months of the year. The vapour pressures are much lower than they are in the summer months. Indeed, on a cold frosty day, we could be looking at vapour pressures in the order of 4.5 to 5 kilopascals. So in the colder months, the vapour pressure externally is much lower. The lowest external vapour pressures are present during the colder months of the year. In other words, at that time, the air is drier. So then, you're asked which is the dampest room. Vapour pressure on the left, 1 kilopascal. Vapour pressure on the right, 0.9 kilopascals. Well, it's the one on the left, isn't it? Quite simply, that's got more water vapour present in the atmosphere than the one on the right. And the vapour pressure is simply reflecting the actual amount of water retained in the air. So the important factors related to surface condensation at this stage are moisture production, and surface temperatures. Moisture production per day is just one of the figures. There are lots of these around and they will vary slightly but in our case let us make that assumption it's all spot on. 14 to 17 litres per day of water is being produced. And the other feature about water vapour is building it moves. Where's most water vapour produced? get a high vapour pressure in the kitchen and bathroom, large areas of water vapour production. And because it's there, it exerts a pressure, it will move down its pressure gradient into other areas of a lower vapour pressure. And this may allow problems to occur in these areas. Also note that wind direction influences the movement of water vapour in the property. Internal and external environments, well, in an unoccupied house, there's roughly the same level of water vapour inside as out. It simply comes into equilibrium between the two. There's very little difference in vapour pressure. After all, what is a house without anybody living in it? An empty box. There's no water vapour being generated internally. However, if we look at an occupied property during the colder months, there is more water vapour internally than outside, simply due to occupational activities. Thus, we now have a difference in vapour pressures between inside and out. And this is known as the differential or excess vapour pressure. However, during the warmer months, this should not be the case, as we'll see in a later module. Ventilation is better with open windows and doors. But during the winter, we do get this difference in vapour pressures.
the differential vapour pressure. The total vapour pressure internally is the sum of internally generated water vapour plus the external water vapour. That gives us the total moisture vapour. So we start finishing off then with more water vapour internally than externally. It's a combination of both internally. And one can see here the relationship between internal and external vapour pressures. The bottom is the external, the red graph is the external, and as we can see, that as the external levels of water vapour go up and down slowly, not the, not the quick peaks and troughs, but overall, then so does the internal vapour pressure. It follows it. The internal levels are affected by external conditions, and sometimes this can be quite considerable. So what is the basic methodology that we could use? Well, number one, the thermohygrometer. We use a thermohygrometer to determine air temperature and relative humidity. Some of them will also determine the dew point. We can then use a psychometric chart to determine relative humidity dew point if we've only got the temperature and humidity. And from this, we can also calculate the vapour pressure. So if we simply take temperature and humidity um, and look at this psychometric chart, on the right scale is relative humidity and the bottom is the temperature. Note the 100% relative humidity line where the air is fully saturated with water. It's at this stage that water will start to come out of the environment. So then, let's imagine it's 60% relative humidity at 20 degrees centigrade. We mark these on our psychometric chart, where X marks a spot where the two factors meet, and then we project a line across to the 100% mark. We cross the line to 100% and then drop a perpendicular, and this says that the dew point, i.e. the point at which condensation will occur under those conditions, is 12 degrees centigrade. Indeed, we can spread the line even further across to the left to our vapour pressure uh, and get 1.4, roughly. So the vapour pressure under those conditions is 1.4 kilopascals and the dew point is 12 degrees centigrade. We can also look, use a psychometric chart to look at temperature changes to a lower relative humidity. For example, imagine it is 80% relative humidity at 15 degrees. What temperature change is required to reduce the relative humidity to 60%? Far more reasonable. Well, let's mark the spots. There's our 80% line and there's our 15 degrees. What do we do? We simply project the line horizontally across to the 60% RH mark or line and then drop a perpendicular and what does that tell us? It tells us that in order to get a relative humidity under those current conditions 80% RH at 15 degrees to get a relative humidity of 60% much lower we need to increase the temperature to 20 degrees. Once we know temperatures, relative humidities and the dew point, we can look for surface temperatures by using a surface temperature thermometer. And this will tell us whether the surface is at or below the dew point or above. If it's at or below, then condensation, surface condensation should be occurring. If it's above the dew point, then it will not be. However, psychometric charts are great. What they're brilliant at doing is, when you're learning, is to have a look at the relationships between temperature and humidity and dew point. One can look at these as two-dimensional charts. However, an easier way to do it is to download one of these calculators to your computer or your telephone. Put in the temperature put in the relative humidity and then we get lots of other readings including vapour pressure as we can see halfway down in kilopascals for those particular conditions. 
However, the distribution of salts in plaster and condensation assessment. One cannot identify the presence of condensation by salt analysis because condensation is an environmental event and that's how it should be determined. So what happens sometimes? Well, there's the distribution of salts in rising damp. Basically, at the base of the wall, there is very little or very low or trace levels, often nothing of significance. A sample is removed, usually from that level, because it's easy and it can be, the damage can be covered by the skirting. It gets analysed, it shows there's free water present, no salt, therefore the client says, OK, it's clearly not rising damp, there are no salts, it must be condensation. Can't be done. If you're going to sample for anything, you go towards the top. But condensation is an environmental event and it's determined by assessing the environment. We often hear about lifestyle causing problems. So what can we regard as lifestyle? Well, for our purposes, it's water generated by occupation. A domestic property should be able to cope with all the water generated from what we could loosely call a normal lifestyle with normally accepted activities, no overcrowding or unrealistic moisture production. So what are normal lifestyles? Well, one could argue there are extremes of normal lifestyles. For example, family one has cereal for breakfast and salads, for tea and so forth, with minimal cooking and out most of the day. Family two all have cooked breakfast, fully cooked dinners in the evening, uh, with children and some occupational day. They're both extremes of normal lifestyles. The property should be able to cope with these extremes by one means or another. And appropriate systems should be in place, especially suitable ventilation. The average domestic property is not really designed to manage excess additional extraneous sources of water, such as unventilated dryers, etc. Just as an interesting case study, condensation is frequently the result of internal water production. It is not the result of damp walls or floors, and this I exclude flooding. But I do mention that some properties have distinctly cold areas, such as dense lintels, and that will significantly the risk, increase the risk of condensation, even though the property is regarded as having a suitably dry environment. This was a property in London, a ground floor flat, part of a much larger complex. Uh, I think there were five high and it was a new pattern of building. Uh, it formed a U shape. And there's the north wall, rear wall. And there was a legal case over this because the lady was losing property, had lots of mould, had real problems with her clothes and so forth and was suing for damage. Well, the main area of visible dampness was basically the rear wall of the lounge, which was facing north. And there we go, the rear wall of the lounge facing north. And the plaintiff's expert had noticed a tide mark. And of course, everybody associates these tide marks with rising damp. And of course, the shape of it was rather odd as well. It was totally in the corner. So... First thing one does is get some atmospheric data, and there it is. What it showed is that North Fall surface was below the dew point, as one would expect. Indeed, the wall was actually running water. There were water literally running down the wall at the time of the inspection. And also, we were taken, the vapour pressures were measured. And the difference between internal and external, the differential vapour pressure was one kilopascal. That is enormous. That is enormous but they said it was rising damp that's where all the water was coming from active rising damp and their expert had noticed drill holes uh, externally along the wall rear wall so anyway we profiled the wall and these are the results we got capillary free moisture content nothing point, point one is nothing it's dry salts we noticed 1200 millimetres, we had a very distinct salt band, can happen. So the walls had rising damp, but it's no longer active. It's no longer active. Now this gave him a problem, since the walls were technically dry, was to find a source of water. There was no free water around. So 
where was the water coming from that was causing the plaintiff's problem? Well, this is where he went next. He claimed it was coming from a wet floor. He has no data on this. And it was coming from a wet floor and condensing on the rear wall. However, when one looks at this, it was a self-leveling floor compound with plastic tiles. And there was this tiny gap. Now, the interesting thing was there were water droplets on the plastic tiles. Why? Because that whole area of perimeter of floor was below the dew point. In other words, condensation was happening and should have been happening because of the below dew point temperature. So what he's now saying is that water is evaporating from an area where it should be condensing and then recondensing on the wall. Well, quite simply, this is rather nonsensical. However, water evaporates from a saturated screed, remember he's talking about the floor, at room temperature at a rate of 75 grams per day for a 16 square meter floor. That's data from the building research station. And re in reality, a wall should be no different. An average individual's lifestyle, i.e. by occupation, can produce around up to 3,500 grams of water per day to 9,000 plus grams of water per day. Huge amounts of water compared with what could be lost from saturated screeds or walls. Thus the origin of the water causing the severe condensation was simply the plaintiff's lifestyle, that is, her water she was producing from occupation and it was absolutely nothing to do with dampness within the fabric of the building. However, that was a snapshot survey and of course the previous methodology will only give us a snapshot of the conditions at the time of the visit. But conditions change continuously, and it's likely that the conditions responsible for the problem will occur at times other than the time of the inspection or survey. It therefore frequently becomes essential in such cases to monitor the environment over a period of time in order to assess the long-term changes in conditions. Dampness in buildings and diagnosis end of module 10.